All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got a very special treat for you today. I've got Everett here with me. Thank you so much for doing this, sir. So let's jump into this and uh, tell us kind of your background. How did you get into uh, the finance world? And then we'll get into uh, building row. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I, uh, I started out when I was in college, I was really interested in, in markets. I started a couple of companies when I was younger and then started trading stocks and I uh, loved like that world. Uh, left college, went into investment banking. I didn't really know what you know the difference was investment banking or trading or uh, you know anything was, but this it was on Wall Street literally. Was, uh, I went to Deutsche Bank uh, and spent about two years there doing uh, doing investment banking. Uh, during that period, I started in two thousand seven. I left in two thousand in two thousand nine. Uh, during that period, like the great, you know, the great financial crisis happened. Um, and what was like really interesting to me or what was like really sort of a surprising to me was how few people, you know, understood what was happening, even while it was happening, um, even inside, you know, one of the largest investment banks, uh, in the world. And, uh, at that point I was, I, I got really interested in global macro. Um, and I started reading what, you know, what Peter Thiel was writing and, uh, you know, and some of the other like luminaries in the space, like Sandra and Miller and, and other people and uh and felt like these were the people that really only got the only people that really got it uh that understood what was actually happening at the time not even like in the future uh and that's what i wanted to do i, I realized that and so i went to i uh, left Deutsche. i went to sac capital um worked for uh, actually for dan tapiero who's on the show recently um I, and then spent a couple of the years at, at other hedge funds leading and growing research uh and investing for 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 kind of managers that in that space Got it. Dan is uh, fantastic. He came on and, uh, and gave me the uh, the hard pitch on uh, gold and Bitcoin both. So uh, he, he, uh, he definitely is, uh, is great. So as, after you did that, um, you eventually end up teaming up with, uh, with a partner and you start Row. Tell us a little bit about just what the impetus for the idea was. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty simple at the time. Um, it's gotten more complex, but it was really that. Uh, you know that fintech had been going after the, the very bottom of the market for a very long time uh, not uh, basically since fintech had started if you think about fintech kind of starting in 2010 you know primarily on the consumer side it was like companies like chime that went after you know the, the lowest end of consumers and on the business side too it was companies like uh you know all like the lending the lending networks that that serve businesses were generally going after like very small kind of mom and pop type businesses um, and I think there's just this assumption in the market that if a company is big, whether they've raised, raised venture capital or they have a lot of people, um, they have some sort of operational complexity that because they're a good client of the bank, uh, they're generally happy. The bank is, you know, is taking care of them. And that was something that we thought was just fundamentally wrong. We thought that actually like the companies, the bigger they were actually like the more problems they had, the more complexity they had, the harder it was to be like really good at servicing them and the more technology that they needed to do better. Um, that was sort of my top down, you know, 30,000 foot view. I came in from as a like investor type and my partner, Alex, uh, who I teamed up with was an operator. He uh, was chief product officer at a company called list, uh, which has, you know, a couple hundred people between New York and London, uh, and it scaled a couple other companies in the past. Uh, and he would hit these growing pains every time he came into a company and, you know, took it from 30 to, you know, hundred, 200 people. Um, so our perspective was that we can fix that and that this is like actually the best way to you know go into this market that's 120 billion dollar market that is pretty commoditized um and uh but has like a lot of room for growth if you can like move past the basic product um got it and so talk a little bit about as you guys have started building the business it seems like you've got a ton of different kind of product lines and have really built out a pretty compelling um, you know, solution for these types of high growth businesses. What does that look like in practice in terms of the, the various touch points you have with the customer? Yeah. I mean, so we started out just building the basic like banking sort of core infrastructure, right? Checking account, we have a treasury management product um, and, a, and a card product. Uh, those are kind of like the, the, the building blocks for, for everything else that came after that. Um, and then we started going past, so like building, uh, building a comprehensive like budgeting platform that allows companies to set you know quarterly annual budgets for different lines and attribute all their expenses to those. Um, you know, deeper syncing with accounting that way everything kind of is is live real time. Uh, user management, accounts payable, like there's a there's a lot in the product. Um, you know, not every company uses everything, and that's kind of the point. It's meant to be kind of continue to grow with you, but um, you know the. Our perspective is always like that, that, that the financial services are, you know, they need to be best in class. They need to be priced competitively. Um, but fundamentally, like what, what matters is like the stuff that actually helps people get their job done every single day. 
Um, and so that's where we invest all our time. And as we grow, like, you know, we think about uh, what do we add that's adjacent to our product that, you know, CFOs and finance teams are using every single day that's interfacing with banking. Um, and that's where we'll continue to grow. I mean, we just launched Accounts Payable, um, which again, it always blew my mind that that was like a, a separate product to begin with, that a company like, like Bill.com, for example, could be so big, uh, performing such a, you know, uh, discrete function. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're headed. Got it. And, and why the focus on those high growth businesses? Like, like there's tons of checking products, there's tons of treasury management products, but like you're not only differentiating in some of the features um, and, and kind of the efficacy of the product, but you're also specifically focusing on a certain part of the market. So like, how do you think about that yeah. market? I mean, what we thought very, we thought very early on was like the market does not need another checking account, right? The market does not need another bank account. Yeah, you can do low fees and all that stuff. That's been done a hundred times. Uh, not to say that someone won't make money doing that, but that wasn't the game we wanted to play. Um, you know what the market did need was like companies need help as they grow, uh, and they need help from a personal level and they need help from a technology level. And banks weren't automatically overnight going to become great at building technology and software. Like they're not right. Like most of the software that you buy from a bank or the software that you rent from a bank, I guess, is like FIS or Fiserv, right? It's built by like one of the core companies. It's not even built by the bank. Um, so we're not really competing with them and on that level at all. We don't, we don't feel like we really compete with anybody on the software level. Um, we compete with banks on the on the product level, but we're you know generally better priced than them to begin with. Um, the uh, so I mean that's that's sort of how we you know what we try to build in terms of like thinking about high growth customers and uh, and why we go towards them. It's actually more that they come towards us. Uh, you know, we're, we're open to anybody. Um, but like, I would say like, we're not the best option if you're a company that's just getting started and you need a basic checking account. Tons of people that can do that for you. As you start to get bigger and bigger and have more people and more complexity and need an all in one solution, like that's where we're the best. And, and that's where we will stand against anybody in the market uh, and, and when, and so, um, that's sort of how we, how we got there. It's not, we don't have an industry specific vertical. We're not like banking for startups or banking for econ or banking for, you know, like marketing or banking for plumbers, like whatever, you know, there's this big thesis out there that like, there's going to be all these banking for companies. Uh, like I, I like, I, I strongly reject that. I think it's way too hard to build. I think it's really hard to be really excellent at this. And I don't think there are gonna be a thousand companies that are excellent at it. Yeah. And help me understand, like, if I'm a startup founder, you know, I start out, there's two or three folks on my team, uh, we start building, uh, we hit this kind of inflection point, we start to scale. Is it difficult to get folks to kind of transition from whatever their original banking service was to you? And kind of how do you think about, um, you know, is a, a somebody who doesn't appear to be a competitor because they're just so far, uh, you know, in a different part of the market, can they basically entrench themselves and make your job harder? Or how do you kind of convince people to basically, um, you know, abandon the, the solution they started with and really move to you guys? Uh, it's like, it's one of those things that it's, it's actually not as hard as it sounds. People like people do build it up. They're like, ah, like switching banks is such a pain. Like, and it's, you know, it's like, if you're big, it's like an hour of work. And if you're small, it's like 20 minutes. Uh, like it's, it's really not that bad. Uh, we have a team that is here to actually help them transition. So, uh, you know, if companies come to us and they want help moving all their stuff, we'll do it for them. Uh, but, um, but from, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's a pretty open ecosystem. Um, you know, banking is like, is, is very, uh, is in a lot of ways, very low tech. Um, and so from, uh, uh, it, it, it's not that bad, but it is like something that people overstate all, all the time. Got it. How did COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, the macro environment, like all the kind of craziness and uncertainty and chaos that happened in 2020, uh, how did that affect your business? Did it accelerate? Was there some obstacles? It definitely accelerated. I mean, I think in two ways, both in terms of, you know, new customer growth and existing customer growth. Um, like we saw the companies on our platform, some of which, you know, grew 200, 300% uh, during the crisis because they were high growth companies to begin with. Or companies that understood technology, again, whatever vertical you're in, uh, you know, did pretty well through the crisis. And it was generally companies that were slower, attached more to the physical world, bricks and mortar, stuff like that, that, you know, unfortunately, like had a, had a really tough time. So um, yeah, you know, it, it definitely like helped uh, our companies and our companies have, I think, you know, emerged stronger in the past year than, than where they were before. 
Got it. And then in terms of um, where you guys go from here, right? What is kind of the product roadmap look like? Um, and how do you kind of see the business evolving? I mean, I don't want to give too much away in terms of product roadmap because I know our competitors watch everything we do these days. Tell but, us all the uh, secrets. Come on. <laughs> but, you know, uh, look, I mean, we're, we're trying to just continue to make like the CFO's life simpler, the company's life, the employee's life simpler um, and work better together with money. That's our mission statement. That's our ethos um, is helping people work better together with money. And, uh, and so we will continue to build product, you know, where there's this fragmented, verticalized ecosystem where CFOs generally have to juggle between seven and 10 products. Like we want to make that ultimately one or two. Um, and so we will just continue to move down that line uh, at, at a measured pace uh, and, and try to, again, just add value to our customers and, and bring the ecosystem together. You know, there's a, the Ben Horowitz or uh, I'm Rick and Dries and I forget which one of them uh, quote, right? But that everything is either bundling or rebundling, unbundling or rebundling. Uh, we are very much in the rebundling uh, business and uh, and believe that the time is now for that. Um, you know, I think it's all, all, everything about startups and about, especially about that is about timing. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep we'll keep rebundling. Got it. Uh, you mentioned CFOs, and it's uh, interesting that you specifically target one person in the executive team of these companies, and you kind of know, hey, look, that's the person that we're trying to make their life easier. T talk a little bit about them as customers. Like, what are some of the things that maybe you guys understand that would be surprising to people who don't spend all day thinking about, you know, making a CFO's life easier? Are there certain complexities or obstacles that they deal with that were surprising, or uh, maybe some, you know, anecdotes in terms of things that CFOs have said to you in the past that, you know, really kind of seared in your brain? and you guys remember? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for us, like our customers, the whole company, like it is, you know, from the employee, the employees all the way up to the CEO, but the CFO is really the, the decision maker and the buyer for us. Uh, and he's the one that's, you know, that's evaluating all the service providers and choosing row versus others. Um, I think it's, I think there's two things that, that really like that motivate, you know, that person uh, when it comes to this particular space. Um, one is like, they understand that like no product is perfect and that like and that having like a, a level of support uh and a person behind that is incredibly valuable uh there was a a, a really dumb banker saying uh that like when i went when met with this like you know like 50 billion dollar bank in the midwest uh when we were like looking for our, our partner bank and they were like yeah cfos just want one neck to one neck to strangle it's like a really off color, odd, uh, I guess, you know, old school banking thing. I haven't been in the banking world for very long, but, uh, but it's kind of true. Uh, you know, they, they, they want that person uh, because it's never going to be perfect uh, or they're always going to have questions or there's always edge cases. Banking is always a game of edge case. So that's one. Two is like, uh, you know, every company is a little bit different and being able to allow them to set up their integrations, the way they run their accounting, you know, the way that they do budgeting, like all that stuff. There is no, we start, you know, we kind of started out with a, this is the way it should be. And that's kind of like a great ethos from a product manager perspective, right? Like don't try to give the customer too many choices. Uh, that's not true in this world. You want as much flexibility as possible um, because every one of these customers looks a little bit different and we're not going to ask them to change the way that they operate. Got it. And are you able to do anything in terms of once you have a business on as a customer, you pretty much have access to you know incredible data. You understand who's growing, who's not growing. Uh, but really what you have is you've got an ecosystem of customers. And do you guys do anything with, um, you know, kind of putting customers together or leveraging um, the growing customer base you have? Like, how do you think about uh, the customers in a, in a kind of totality um, of the actual customer base? Is there anything there that you guys have done? Yeah, I mean, we try to, so we'll continue to like productize that more, but we try to put our, our customers um, in specific verticals together with, you know, the same account representatives. Um, and he's able to connect them all the time and connect them, you know, if he's covering uh, e-commerce or another one's covering, um, you know, specific areas in venture, uh, being able to connect them with each other, connect with investors like that are, you know, also on our platform. So there's a, you know, similar to like, I guess what uh, some of the, like, the more established banks will do, you know, for, for some of their clients, uh, we, we embrace that as well. Um, and so that is, you know, that is where we are today. I think as we grow, yeah, like we'll look to add more technology around that, uh, and ultimately like formalize that. But, but today it, it is, uh, you know, it is an inc incredible collective of like super high growth, super interesting companies that are doing, that are doing cool stuff. Um, and they generally want to know each other. So we're happy to facilitate that. Got it. 
Makes sense. What's been the most surprising thing, um, you know, since you started the business? Um, I think the most surprising thing has been like, uh, I don't know, I guess, I mean, I guess, look, I guess the most surprising thing or for me, um, coming from like a non-tech background, um, has been just like the, the product development cycle. Um, and the fact that like you, you know, there's truly like no shortcut, like it is time times people, uh, add more people, you can do it faster take the same amount of people to start, uh, but that is it. And so you need to make, be like really disciplined and, and parsimonious in terms of your choices uh, about what you're gonna build. Um, thankfully, I have like an amazing product manager as a partner who, you know, has taught me that lesson over and over again. Otherwise I would have, it would have been harder, but uh, but yeah, that's been like kind of the most, most interesting thing, I think for me coming from the other side of the universe. Got it. And then what's been the one thing that maybe you've really said, Hey, you know, we want to accomplish X, but you guys haven't been able to do it yet. Whether it's just, uh, we're not there yet in terms of building the product. Uh, there's some other limitation, maybe even regulation or, or whatever it is. Is there something that sticks out in terms of you, you guys are almost chasing it, but haven't yet done it. I mean, there has, honestly, there hasn't been much like we, you know, we've always like said, I guess what this is yet another thing that's been surprising is like that there's kind of nothing that you can't do. Like we would always start with something like that and then work backwards and find a way to do it, whether it's through a partnership or on our own. Um, you know, it's just more that you can't do everything all at once. Uh, but I, I have, we haven't found anything that it's like, man, I wish we could do this thing that JP Morgan can do. Um, you know, it, it really is just a function of time. Um, I think for us, it's like, you know, we want to be, uh, you know, we want to be a multi-billion dollar institution. We think we'll, we'll be there by the end of this year. Um, and that is like what we're chasing uh, today. Got it. It makes a ton of sense. Uh, Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain, kind of this whole decentralized digital world uh, is now getting tons and tons of attention. Um, you guys being in financial services is you know somewhat tangentially related. How do you think about that space? And are you guys doing anything there? Or yeah. uh, you know, will you do something in the future? Yeah, I mean, we started out building uh, building a lot of like a lot of decentralized tech uh, on our ledger. We ended up like using parts of it, but not not all of it, um, and went more a more traditional approach at the beginning. But it's definitely something that both myself and my co-founder were super enmeshed in uh, at the start. In terms of um, you know, in terms of like the space, yeah, like we're always looking at DeFi. Um, and, and is there an opportunity to be able to, you know, bring our customers into that? I would say like, there's still like fundamental challenges that, that make that like tough at the moment. Um, but I, I, we expect that that will change as like, you know, as you have more of an ecosystem and you can basically borrow, borrow from those markets in a, in a USD, like you can't kind of, you know, you have an asset liability mismatch if you're borrowing crypto and, and, and your liabilities are in dollars, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of other stuff, you know, in terms of Bitcoin, like. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was a macro uh, analyst and PM for for a long time. And I was always the smarter guys that I, that I worked for would always tell me to like focus on focus on the supply side uh, of any of any market because it's the most predictable, um, whether you're looking at oil, whether you're looking at like stocks, whether you're looking at, like you can actually like solve backwards from like supply. And that will generally give you like a, a pretty good indication of like where market's gonna go. So like in a lot of ways, like, I mean, crypto and like Bitcoin is like kind of like the perfect market. It's the perfect, like, um, because like you do have like a, a fundamentally locked, locked uh, supply that's gonna decline. Um, you know, I remember looking at it and I'm, I feel dumb for not buying more of it. Uh, you know, in 20, like 11 or 2013, and I, I was like, uh, I was like, this is like the perfect bubble in a lot of ways, because it is like, literally, I couldn't, you couldn't construct something that, that would, uh, that would, you know, that would like, this is exactly what we would look for. Basically, this is exactly what I would look for as an analyst in a market, like where's the market where supply is going down and where there's like, you know, uh, there's inherent demand that's, that's growing. And it's like really that simple. So I think it's, um, you know, the market, it's super volatile. It'll move every day and, you know, it might go up or down 30%, you know, but, uh, but like it has, you know, the right characteristics. Absolutely. And it's pretty incredible. I think that, um, it is that simple, right? It's just uh, it, from a market structure standpoint, like the supply goes down, 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 and there's a caps overall supply. And then you get a increasing demand. And like, if you took an economics 101 course, you know what happens next, right? And the fall price yeah. gets up. Like, it's not rocket science. Um, no, it's pretty simple. I mean, the other thing is like markets are made at the margin, right? So it doesn't take that much buying to move it. Uh, 
like I think you know, yes, it's a what it, I've, I've, I don't know what it is right now, trillion dollar market cap or whatever it is, but you know, how much is actually moving every day and settling at the end of the day, not just like trading intraday. Um, it, it's not just like any market; it doesn't take that much to move out. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about kind of the decentralized uh, finance movement, right? So, you know, whether it's being built on Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or wherever, uh, just this idea of like, let's build these decentralized applications um, that replace a lot of the same financial service or banking functions. How, have you guys looked at that or, or kind of what are your thoughts there? Yeah, we, I mean, we've looked at it. I think, you know, I think there's a, a really bright future there. Again, I think our, our perspective on the space was that the ecosystem was Look, that the challenge is really building an audience. It is really building like uh, you know a community of businesses uh, and and providing value. And I think that fundamentally, as a borrower, uh, which most of our businesses would would be in this instance, um, you know they they shouldn't really care. Uh, is it you know like they just they need to be able to grow their business. That's what they care about. They're not they're not there to make you know bets on crypto. They're not there to like. Um, to, to do sort of stuff in DeFi, they just want a better product. Um, and so our, our perspective has always been like, if it gives our customer a lower cost of interest, if it gives our customer a better borrowing experience, uh, you know, we will embrace it. I would say today, like it's still far off, but it's not, but it's moving very fast uh, to the point where I think that there's, there's a real opportunity there. And like so much of, uh, of credit and of, 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 you know, of finances, uh, is is so manual um, and is so old school that you know I'm really excited about a lot of the, the developments in that space um, because I think that they will accelerate um, you know the adoption of credit and in for a lot of these customers. Absolutely, that makes uh, makes a ton of sense. What's the one big thing that you guys are looking forward to in 2021? You mentioned kind of trying to accomplish a, a multi billion dollar you know kind of institutional um, you know, valuation or, or milestone, but what's the big thing that gets you guys there? Yeah, I mean, like multi-billion in terms of like like the assets of our clients on our platform, and I think we'll we'll be there pretty fast. Um, like what gets us there is like just continuing to put our heads down and execute. Honestly, I mean, we spent two years, uh, you know, with like really no product, uh, sorry, with no market, uh, focusing on product uh, before we launched. Um, you know, we think very firmly the best product in the market wins. Uh, we've done like basically no marketing. Like we really are, you know, focused on learning from our customers, growing around them. Uh, and building out that way. So, um, you know, there's a lot of other people that are, you know, doing a lot of hand waving and putting billboards everywhere and whatever. We're not about that. Like we're, we're really just trying to focus and, and win. Got it. Uh, we didn't talk about the name. Uh, where did Roe oh, yeah. come from? Uh, so Roe is like the DVO one of an option, right? It's like, if interest rates go up by X percent, what is my option worth? And it was kind of a metaphor for like what we, how we try to help our customers, right? Uh, it's like, we're, we're gonna improve your trajectory a little bit, not a ton, like that's up to you, but you know, enough. Uh, and, and so that's sort of where it, where it came from. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, the fintech space in general, it seems like everyone is spacking, going public, uh, raising monster rounds, like the, just the interest from the public markets and you know, large late stage uh, growth investors is off the charts. Is that something that's uh, kind of a bubble or frothy and like, yeah, there's a point in time where this all is fun and games, but like it's getting out of hand? Or do you guys feel like, uh, no, you know, investors have it right and uh, kind of digital, you know, businesses that focus on the finance industry are really just getting started? And I'm cheating because asking somebody who's building a company in the space is uh, uh, probably a little biased, but, but how do you think about that? I mean, I am uh, for sure. I'm a little biased because I made that. You know, this is the bet that I made with with my career. Uh, I had the same conversation two years ago uh, with my with our investors. They're like, ah, this is a bubble. You know, so you know, valuation should be here. Blah blah blah. Uh, and I was like, no, it's it's a new asset class. It's not a bubble. Like venture, you know, at the time was five hundred million, five hundred billion dollars versus like PE, which was like two billion. Now it's like a billion versus two billion. Uh, but uh, I, I absolutely, I'm sorry, trillion versus two trillion. Uh, I, I absolutely uh, don't think it's a bubble. Um, I think that there's two things that are happening. One, uh, interest rates are zero, right? Real rates are negative. That means future value equals present value for all intents and purposes. So find something that's gonna grow. Like it should be worth a lot today, even if they're not making that much money today. Uh, if interest rates go back up, which is like a very big if, uh, like that will change a bit. But like that is appropriately priced for where we are today in the cycle and investors should understand that. 
Uh, I think the second thing is that it has never been possible in history, uh, at least as far as I know, to uh, to build companies from the ground up that you know can compete with you know fifty hundred billion dollar companies that exist in public markets today. Uh, and as an investor, you know, would I rather put a billion dollars into Stripe or whatever the new Stripe is, or like you know Tsys or you know one of these like like WorldPay or someone like that? Right. Like I would much I can I can guarantee you it's going to be more valuable in an earlier stage company uh, that can replicate, you know, what is what exists today in public markets than what exists in public markets. And private markets are only about six percent of public markets overall. Right. If you think about total market cap globally. So, no, I think it's a new reality. And I think that it is like, uh, you know, comparisons to the previous bubble are pretty misplaced. Um, it's a new asset class. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. And I think also the thing that people are uh, m underestimating and, and maybe, um, you know, kind of just completely missing is the global nature of this. Uh, and also yeah. just how much more efficient, how much more profitable, how much more scalable uh, the digital versions are, right? Or kind of these totally. like new age uh, technologies. And, and some of it's literally like you're a digital business and the competitor you have is a digital business, but you're using technologies that are far superior and therefore more scalable, more efficient, um, you know, kind of more valuable to the customer. Uh, and in some cases, literally you're going up against a bank that sells a tax machine, right? Like, like it really right. is kind of all over the place, but uh, it seems like you guys really have an advantage from uh, the position you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that there's so much, there's opportunity everywhere, you know, not just in the space we're doing and consumer and like all over FinTech. Um, like, I don't think, you know, the the top five banks uh, have been the top five banks for the past 30 years, literally. Um, I think the next 20 years, like that, that will not be the case. Like it will be someone like us, someone like Chime, um, that will be that will be up there. Yeah, I love that. Uh, before I finish up, I always ask everyone the same three questions and you'll get to ask me one to finish up. Uh, the first one is more serious. What's the most important book that you've ever read? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the most impactful book I ever read was uh, a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, right, what is that? So it was written in, I think, like 1979 or something like that. And it was, uh, but it's about a about a 100 page book. It's pretty short. Um, and it's really about like embracing a performance mindset. Um, I, re I was given to me when I like started uh, trading uh, at, from, a, from another PM and uh, it was, uh, it's a great book. It's it's a great book for no matter what you're doing, but especially if you're in a performance driven job um, where you really have to, you know, learn how to like focus on your, uh, on, on your insights and instincts uh, and sort of quiet, it's quiet, like the uh, sort of part of your mind that is, that is fighting that. Uh, because that's where like, you know, if you're playing tennis, okay, like you just, you just have to go flow. And, but if you're doing anything else, right, if you're running a portfolio, like you have insights that other people don't see, and those are hard to kind of get at, like right? your brain is constantly telling you, you know, no, like, and you have to unlock that a little bit. And, or if you're building a company and same thing, like, so I thought that was a really good one. I've read it about four times. I should probably read it, read it again. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. I, lo I love that. Uh, I've never heard of that book, so I'll definitely check it out. Uh, next one's a little bit more personal. Uh, and this is a question sponsored by Eight Sleep, which has got this uh, kind of cool mattress. Uh, Mateo, the uh, CEO, got on me and said, hey, man, you got to start sleeping more, use this thing. Uh, and all of a sudden, now I feel like I'm sleeping on an ice block, but uh, I get deeper REM sleep. Uh, and it pretty much changed the way that uh, awesome. I feel during the day. How do you sleep? Are you a four or five hour person? Are you a 10 hour person? What, what's kind of your sleep routine? I, uh, I have a two year old daughter. So my sleep routine has changed a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, I'm a, let's see, I, I'm basically, my, my sleep revolves around her uh, basically. So when she goes to bed, I try to get to bed and then she wakes up earlier than me and it's like hitting me on the head, when, you know, whatever, 6 a.m. I uh, uh, I recently started asking this question, and so I don't have a ton of data points. But uh, every single person with a kid under the age of three years old makes sure that that is a known part of the uh, the change in the sleep routine. So uh, <laughs> it's a big the, change. The, the young child is uh, is now the boss. It seems like totally, absolutely. Uh, and then uh, my final question before you get to ask me one is more fun, which is aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? Can I be in the middle? Like, I, I wouldn't, I think okay. there's like a decent chance, uh, but I, you know, it's not a belief or non-belief thing. It's a probability. I think it's, it's a non-zero probability. Okay. 
And uh, if you're in the middle, I'm going to assume you're similar to me of like, yes, there. it's highly probable that just given the, how big the universe is, uh, it you know, there's some form of intelligent life, but they're not little green men that visited Earth type thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. The universe is pretty big. Uh, so there's probably some something out there, most likely, mathematically. But, uh, you know, they probably haven't been here. We probably haven't been there, but I don't know. There's a lot. Yeah, you gotta ask smarter people that that one. That's uh, that's over my pay grade. There's a guy in. Uh, I think he's from Israel. He was like uh, in charge of you know extraterrestrial search in Israel or whatever. And uh, now he's come out. He's older and he's claiming that there's like a galactic federation and uh, all the planets are all part of it. And I was like, really? What? I was like, you, you might have stared in uh, telescopes for too long or something. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You got to get Elon Musk on the show and ask, ask him that. He's, Absolutely. Uh, uh, you could ask me one question to finish up. What do you got for me? All right. Uh, well, what do you think? I mean, look, uh, you know, it's been a crazy world for for crypto. Uh, like, are we, you know, are we overhyped at this point? Is this just the beginning of of you know the next the next wave? Uh, uh, you know, where do you think? How do you think we we shape out here? Yeah. So I think that. Um, I have three separate thoughts that are all related. One is uh, we are at the start of what I'll call like the institutional bull market. So kind of last two or three bull markets have really been retail driven. This yeah. is really the first institutional bull market. So it's got room to run from like a price standpoint, how yeah. high it goes, how long it lasts. You know, that, Again, people much smarter than me will, will figure that out. But just like, hey, the institutions are now here. They're buying Bitcoin. They're starting to look at the space. Like they're taking this much more seriously than they ever have. Uh, and I think that only gets more pervasive and, and more significant over time. Um, two is uh, everyone is probably drastically underestimating how important and big uh, just this general move is. So I, yeah. you know, I basically think of it in two different frameworks. So one is like the digital version of all of these businesses is going to be way bigger than the current iteration. And if you really think like, I think a lot of people compare digital to analog. I always talk about there's almost this like, middle step where it was like analog that went to really electronic, like with electronic Q-SIPs. And so there was some, okay. you know, computer enabled type transactions. But if you look at like the technology you're using versus some of these legacy banks, like you guys are really digital. Those yeah. banks are more kind of electronic QSIP. And so it's better than yeah. analog, but like there was still some bureaucracy and and, uh, and some pain points and middlemen and all that that you guys are removing. So I think that like digital will be bigger than kind of electronic or analog. The other thing is that I think that the decentralized protocols will be bigger than their centralized counterparts. Some of that will be like protocol versus companies. Some of that will just be decentralized protocol versus centralized product, whatever it ends up being. Um, I think it's a ways out, like maybe, you know, we're like five years away from that, but really being, uh, you know, kind of pervasive. Uh, and so if you really start to look at that as like, okay, I want to be in digital finance and I eventually want to be in digital decentralized finance, Bitcoin's probably the only thing that really kind of hits that spot right now. It's had this incredible right. run. Um, but like when you look at how big is that market, like most people are talking about like, you know, does Bitcoin go to a hundred K? I'm thinking like Bitcoin's a hundred trillion dollar market cap at some point in the future. And again, I don't know if that's, 50 years from now, right? Or 20, right? but it's not tomorrow, right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it's pretty far away. And so then you get into this world of like, well, okay, if that's just like the core unit of account, well then like, what's all the other value that gets created? Like the decentralized infrastructure, decentralized lending, like all of that's gonna happen. Um, yeah. It's just hard to tell like who builds it and how long it takes. And then the last thing I think is, uh, it's not a straight line. So you kind of have like, yes, we're an institutional bull market Two, we're all underestimating how big this is gonna be. But three is like, you know, put your seatbelt on because this is going to be super volatile along the way, right? I mean, yeah, you know, you kind of look totally. at the business you guys have built. There's days where you probably feel euphoric and it's like, we're going to, you know, be the next uh, top five bank. And then there's days where you're like, oh my God, like, the, you know, the house is on fire, right? And sometimes that may happen in the morning and afternoon in the same day, just given like, you know, the challenges of building a company. And so I think that uh, people just have to remember like, you know, there's going to be price corrections along the way. There's going to be protocols that, you know, uh, fail and, and kind of all of that type of stuff. And so it's, you can be bullish on a really long time horizon, but also be, you know, somewhat patient in the short to medium term and understand like all great things just take time to build. Yeah. And so I think that's yeah. you know, how I look at it. It doesn't necessarily give us answers. It's like where people should go put their money. But I think it's a framework that kind of, you know, rationally explains like where we go. 
Uh, that's awesome. That is, uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about Row? Yeah, uh, so you can come see us at rho, dot co. Um, and uh, and if you're a company or your CFO or um, just want to learn more, you can book an appointment with with one of our team members. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Everett Cook NY. Uh, I'm not very active though. Uh, we're also at Row Business Banking. Uh, sorry, Row Business on Twitter. We, we got to get you on Twitter and uh, and tweet, man. I've been following you for a while, actually. I uh, you know I yeah. <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm expecting now for you to just start with uh, a couple of hot takes after we do this podcast. And, uh, All right, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> you can retweet they, if I say anything smart. Yeah, they, I'll retweet it. Be my two year old keeps me awake at night, and you'll uh, you'll, you'll be the most popular guy. <laughs> That's right. Because every young That's right. Will, uh, will agree. <laughs> awesome, cool. man. Listen, thank you so much, for Everett. I, I really appreciate this, and uh, I think that uh, people will uh, will one uh, have learned a lot, but also two. Uh, I think you just sitting at a, a really interesting intersection between a bunch of different disciplines and uh, obviously the business you guys build is fantastic. So I just suggest people go check it out, row.co uh, or, uh, or go find you on Twitter. Awesome.